ask that you mute your microphones until we get to the Q&A session, um, in which case then we can unmute. Um, if you have questions or comments or things that come up throughout the presentation, feel free to put those um, in the chat and then we'll save them for our presenters as we get going towards the end. So thank you all again for joining us today. I'm um, so excited that you're here for our third Lunch and Learn. Um, and today our topic is going to be on maintaining good mental health. But before we get into our presentation, um, I wanted to share a little bit about who we are in the center for those who may be new to um, our Lunch and Learn series. So we are the Vanderbilt Memory and Alzheimer's Center. Um, we're located on uh, Vanderbilt's campus. And we are a team full of faculty, clinicians, and scientists that are working to solve the complexities of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we have research, both clinical research, as well as basic science research that we do, trying to understand um, the basic underlying causes of disease, uh, working to look for methods and markers for early identification, and also working on different types of therapies and interventions to prevent um, and to cure Alzheimer's disease. So we have about 54 overall faculty on our team and we are um, trans-institutional. So we represent Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, as well as Meharry Medical College. Um, and we have three different primary research areas. We look at risk of Alzheimer's disease, um, resilience, so people that um, are resilient and don't develop Alzheimer's disease, we think there's a lot to learn there in terms of therapies, as well as we look at disparities and trying to understand why some um, aspects of individuals in our population have higher incidence rates of disease. I am Renee Robinson. I'm an associate professor of chemistry and neurology. Um, and you may have heard me at the last two Lunch and Learns if you've attended before. And I have the honor today of um, introducing two of our team members who also work in the center. Um, you may have seen uh, Mrs. Avery Holler, who was um, at the last two, who helped to moderate the sessions for me. Um, but today she's going to be um, uh, presenting on our topic. She is the training and communications manager at our center. She has a master's of public health from Bastyr University, where she focused on making trauma-informed care information accessible to communities. Um, Avery is very passionate about creating structures that support mental health in our workplaces, schools, and in other institutions. Our other um, speaker for today is Mrs. Pamela Cowley, who has spent many years of her career working with countless others to promote and improve health literacy, health insurance coverage, as well as access to equitable care. Um, Mrs. Callie joined the Vanderbilt uh, Memory and Alzheimer's Center this year, and she is our community outreach and engagement manager. And as the surviving daughter of a mother who had Alzheimer's disease, she is dedicated to helping families affected by this devastating illness. Um, so one quick uh, housekeeping announcement again, if you could mute your microphones, um, feel free to put questions and comments in the chat. And when we get to the Q&A, um, then I'll open up the floor for you. So now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mrs. Avery Holler to get us going on maintaining good mental health. Thank you, Avery. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Robinson. And I'm really excited to talk to everyone today. As Dr. Robinson mentioned, mental health is really one of my areas of passion um, and creating a world in which um, good mental health is the standard is something that I strive for. Um, there will be some interactive uh, parts of my presentation. So we will be using the chat function, which is just that chat button down at the bottom of your screen. And then we uh, will also, um, you will have the ability to unmute your mic and uh, make a few comments throughout the presentation. So we'll have a little bit of interactive um, before we get to the Q&A in addition to the Q&A. So today we are going to cover a few aspects of mental health, especially as they relate to Alzheimer's disease patients and Alzheimer's disease caregivers. We are going to talk about what mental health is and what the um, landscape of mental health looks like. Um, we are going to talk about mental health specifically in Alzheimer's disease and some of the considerations there, um, including some of the considerations for caregivers in terms of uh, burnout. And we're gonna learn about a term called ambiguous loss. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about that later too. Uh, and then we are also, of course, not going to leave ourselves um, in the depths of uh, 
the negative mental health talk, we are also going to talk about resilience um, and how we can build our um, mental health strength um, and how we can create communities that are uh, in, that encourage mental health for all members. And then Pam is going to take over and she is going to give a little bit about her experience as a caregiver and then tell you all about some local resources um, to hopefully take some of the burden off you and uh, make more of the caregiving and the experience um, more of a collective endeavor. So let's get started with what is mental health. So I, when we think of mental health, I often get images or advertisements that say things like, you should be super happy all the time, or you should be a really, really productive citizen, always ready to work. Um, you should be able to meditate for 20 hours a day in silence. You should go on spa vacations and just be relaxed all the time. Oh, and you should also have this perfect family life where everybody gets along and you can take beautiful pictures together. And so this is kind of what we're sold as mental health, just this perfect life. You're relaxed. There's nothing wrong. You're able to just um, rest all the time or be really productive with no problems. In reality, mental health is a lot more complex than that. Mental health is about having the resilience and strength to cope with hard things. Mental health is about being able to have the um, emotional ability to go to a grandchild's play or be out in the community. Mental health is about having a few close friends or family members that you can confide in. Mental health is about having the courage to try new things um, and being able to set aside the fear. And finally, mental health is really about hope. So no matter what adversity is happening, what difficult things are happening, maintaining that sense of hope is one of the good ways that we can have a barometer on our mental health, that we can know that we're feeling mentally strong. So the American Psychological Association defines mental health as a state of mind characterized by emotional well-being, good behavioral adjustment, relative freedom from anxiety and disabling symptoms, and a capacity to establish constructive relationships and cope with the ordinary demands and stresses of life. So that's a mouthful. Um, and there's a lot of uh, big words in that definition um, that it trip me up when I'm trying to understand it. Um, but the pieces that I really wanna pull out here are um, especially this last sentence about coping with the ordinary demands and stresses of life. So getting to a place where our mental health is good does not mean that we've eliminated all the stressors in our life. Getting to a place where our mental health is um, feeling strong is about getting to a place where no matter what stresses happen, um, especially the common everyday stresses, we are able to maintain that sense of hope. We are able to maintain this freedom from anxiety, which means kind of like freedom from fear. We are able to still try new things. We are able to still connect with those that we love. However, it's not always easy and especially um, in the context of Alzheimer's disease, uh, both caregiving and as a patient, there are a lot of challenges to mental health. Mental health is also very powerful. So it might surprise you that one in five people in the US will experience mental illness in a given year. And depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. This slide shows a little bit about the prevalence of mental health disorders in older Americans. And what, uh, so this on this side, we've got the percent. Um, and then each of these colors represents a different category of um, mental health issue. So we've got depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and personality disorder. Um, and I would love for you to either pop in the chat or you can feel free to unmute your microphone and tell me if there's anything that surprises you about this graph. And Dr. Robinson, I'll ask you to kind of take a look at the chat and let me know if responses come through there. 
So is there anything surprising to you about this graph? I guess I would have thought that depression would be higher than um, the personality disorder. My day. Yes, that one surprised me too. Um, Mrs. Grissom says the lower percentages as we get older, personality yes. disorder is higher than I thought, um, that depression affects older people. I would think depression would be higher as well. Um, what is considered a personality disorder? That's a great question. So personality disorders are things like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, and there are several others, but those are the two, two of the most common that we might encounter. Those seem rather high under those circumstances. Um, yes. Surprised and decrease as age increases. There's another comment from Mr. Mueller. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of these briefly. So yes, I think one thing that um, stands out to a lot of people is that um, high incidence of personality disorder. And so one of the um, points that's really important to make about that is that there are a lot of people struggling with these invisible illnesses. So they may not look sick on the outside, um, but on the inside, they really are struggling with some mental health issues. Um, and then in terms of the uh, kind of as you age, the incidence of mental health disorders going down, um, that, that has been uh, shown in many, many studies. And essentially, uh, as we get older, oftentimes we experience um, more life satisfaction rather than less. And so, and actually um, depression is uh, some of the highest rates and around midlife. Um, and then it starts to go down. However, as somebody pointed out, which is really important, there are still many, many older adults who are experiencing depression. As you can see, it sort of flattens out here and stays pretty steady through people's 80s. Um, and I think one thing that is a big challenge when we're discussing mental health, especially for older Americans is, or older adults in general, is that we don't think of some of the symptoms that they may be experiencing as depression. Um, we just think, oh, it's normal to kind of um, want to stay inside all day or uh, not do very much, not get out in the community. And really those could be symptoms of depression. And as we will talk about a little bit later in terms of Alzheimer's disease in particular, there's a lot of overlap between Alzheimer's disease symptoms and depression symptoms. But another point I wanna make before um, we go uh, too far into some of the um, more technical pieces is that mental health and keeping ourselves mentally healthy is ancient. So really our mental health is baked into our cultural traditions. So when we gather around a campfire, it's just like we're gathering around the campfires of ancient days. And it gives us that hit of belonging and community and um, some of those things that make us feel like we can trust our environment around us that are so important for mental health. Things like artistic expression are incredibly important for mental health. And we have evidence at least 40,000 years back in the anthropological record, the historical record of humans engaging in artistic activities. Our church choirs, our concerts, these are all ways that we can get that sense of belonging that helps ourselves um, stay mentally healthy. And then finally, our traditions like weddings, um, play, ceremonies um, and rituals are very important to our mental health and having those times when we can come together as a community can be really helpful for people. Um, that I also wanna make the point, this is one of the reasons that COVID and the COVID-19 pandemic has been so difficult is we've missed a lot of these gathering opportunities, these parts of our culture that um, just have our mental health uh, built into them. Um, and then one last point I wanted to make about this is just that, again, when we think of mental health, sometimes we think, 
oh my gosh, I have to learn how to meditate and meditate 20 times a day. And really, we don't have to go that far. We just have to stay engaged with our community um, so that we can let these ancient practices and these ancient ways of being together help support us. And then I just wanted to give a little shout out to Tennessee. So um, I think most people on this call today are from Tennessee. Um, so social and emotional support is a huge factor in maintaining mental health, especially when it comes to depression and anxiety. And Tennessee actually uh, has a pretty high rate of um, older adults who, uh, who um, feel supported. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out to Tennessee. Okay, so I want to now hear your thoughts on why mental health matters in Alzheimer's disease. So you can go ahead and pop in the chat or you can unmute your mic. Let me know why you think mental health matters in Alzheimer's disease. Avery, this is Wanda. And for my dad, he knew he didn't know what was going on. And so if we didn't know, or we had a question, or um, we were talking about things he wasn't sure of, it really, um, it, a, a lot of fear would come. And, and I remember one time, Mother and I were looking for something and we couldn't find it, driving around looking for something, couldn't find it. And my dad went berserk. He was in the back seat. If he, we didn't know, he knew he didn't know. And he just was so afraid. And it just seems like if um, the people around the Alzheimer's person um, are not calm, it, it just magnifies in their lives. It, it, you know, it's just yes. much worse. Yes, Wanda, you are bringing up such a good point that we're actually going to talk about um, in a few slides. Agitation or anxiety is something that a lot of Alzheimer's patients experience. Um, and it can be very disconcerting, both for the person who's experiencing it as well as the family members. And feel free to put your ideas in the chat. Um, here's one, Avery. I know mental health matters in Alzheimer's, yet my question is how to address it when a patient has zero short-term memory. Yes, that is such a good question. Um, we are going to talk about that in a little bit, some certain techniques that you can use, um, de-escalation techniques. But I think that ultimately I'm a little biased because I think that um, structural building in um, structural ways to take care of this are even better than some of the individual coping mechanisms, but sometimes the structural support doesn't exist. So we need to really, really rely on the individual coping mechanisms. Um, so definitely come back to that question later. And if you feel like it wasn't addressed, let's talk about that in the Q&A also. Okay, great. Any others before we move forward? That's it in the chat. Okay, I will move on. And then if you have other ideas, we can talk about this at the end um, as well after we go through all the other information. So one of the really important reasons that mental health matters in Alzheimer's disease is that because of the cognitive symptoms like memory loss and behavior change, Alzheimer's disease is actually considered a mental health issue as well as a physical health issue. So the World Health Organization actually has Alzheimer's disease under its list of mental health issues, um, uh, especially related to older adults. So for the um, researchers, uh, is at Vanderbilt Memory and Alzheimer's Center and all the Alzheimer's centers around the country, we are looking at both the mental health issues and also the physical health issues that are underlying some of those cognitive changes. So some of the mental health related symptoms of Alzheimer's disease are mood changes, increased agitation or anxiety, personality changes, memory loss, um, and the decreased ability to plan or problem solve. 
Another reason that mental health matters in Alzheimer's disease is that caregivers also experience mental health issues. Um, so this figure is from the Alzheimer's Association and it's just showing how many, what a high percentage of caregivers report very high either emotional stress or physical stress due to caregiving. And then I wanted to touch on why mental health is so hard to talk about. So number one, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease can be very difficult to accept. As Alzheimer's disease progresses, everyday experiences can become overwhelming to the patient as Wanda was just sharing. And mood and behavior changes can be a sensitive topic among family members, um, especially when some of those mood or behavior changes feel kind of sudden or feel related to the disease. Um, and generally, mental health isn't something that we have a very open dialogue about, um, but the most important way and the best way to support a family member's mental health is to encourage that open dialogue, to really um, make it okay to talk about feelings, to make it okay to talk about frustrations uh, is very, very important for supporting each other's mental health. So now I'm going to go into a, um, a little bit more specific for Alzheimer's patients and Alzheimer's caregivers. I'm going to talk about depression and agitation in Alzheimer's patients. And then uh, in Alzheimer's caregivers um, or dementia, any type of dementia caregiver, um, I'm going to talk about burnout and then this idea of ambiguous loss, um, which is just one of my favorite concepts um, that I've learned about in the last few years because it explains so much for me about why it can be so hard um, to deal with the type of grief that happens when somebody you know is experiencing a major illness like Alzheimer's. And then of course, like I mentioned before, we are going to talk a lot about resilience um, and how to build up our resilience to keep ourselves mentally healthy and also um, anybody that we're taking care of. So, as I mentioned, there's a lot of overlap between the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and the symptoms of depression, especially late life depression. And the same vascular risk factors, so those heart health risk factors that contribute to Alzheimer's disease may also contribute to depression. And there's a researcher at the Vanderbilt Memory and Alzheimer's Center, Warren Taylor, who has been a pioneer in some of this research on vascular depression. And so what we start to get is this um, kind of swirl of overlap between depression and Alzheimer's. And in fact, if you go into your neurologist for a memory workup, um, basically to get some memory tests and um, understand some of your symptoms that are happening, they will also give you a depression screen. Because once again, some of these late life depression symptoms uh, actually look a lot like Alzheimer's disease and vice versa. So late life depression symptoms, which are slightly different than early life depression symptoms. So if somebody gets depression in their 20s, it's gonna look a little bit different than somebody who gets depression in their 60s or 70s. Um, so late life depression symptoms, irritability, so social withdrawal, difficulty concentrating, losing attention easily, slow problem solving skills, poor sleep, and poor sleep is really a big one. These are also symptoms of, can be symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, like social withdrawal, irritability, slow problem solving, difficulty concentrating, losing words. Um, they're absolutely similar symptoms presenting, but a different underlying illness. So it can be kind of confusing for families at first as you're um, first starting these journeys is, um, is it depression? Is it Alzheimer's? Um, is it Alzheimer's, but there's some depression involved? And so again, that open dialogue is so important. Okay, and now I am going to play a video about agitation in um, Alzheimer's patients. And I hope this works and you all can hear it. Um, and if not, I will recap the video. Here it goes. Stress and agitation. Yeah. 
Avery, we can't hear this sound. Okay, in that case, I am just going to recap the video. Um, so basically, um, agitation um, is something that commonly happens uh, for people, patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and really like Wanda's story earlier illustrated this um, excellently. Um, as people are experiencing Alzheimer's symptoms and they're feeling that um, they can't remember things, they can't remember where things are, it can be a very frustrating experience to go from um, being totally capable and able to um, do everything for yourself and then needing to rely on other people or feeling like you aren't able to fully take care of yourself. Um, and sometimes that uh, results in agitated or anxious behavior um, and possibly sometimes some like aggressive behavior towards the people that are around them, which can be very upsetting to both the person and the people around them. Um, and one of the most important things we can do in a situation where somebody is getting agitated or feeling anxious is to stop whatever's happening and slow down if possible. Um, I, some of the times that this happens most frequently is when people are running late, um, running late to an appointment or things just aren't working out in the day. Um, but some of the de-escalation techniques are stop and slow down um, try to get the, to the root of what's really causing the agitation so that you can remove those triggers in the future. Um, and then distraction is also a, can be a very powerful technique, trying to change the subject, trying to just move on from whatever's happening. Um, but again, I just want to kind of hold space for the fact that this can be one of the more upsetting um, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And again, that open dialogue is so important. So we've got open dialogue about mood and behavior changes with depression. And then we've got open dialogue about maybe some frustrations in relationship building um, with agitation. And then, oops, we are now going to talk about mental health and Alzheimer's caregivers. Um, and really this is any type of dementia caregiver, not just Alzheimer's caregivers and could be extended um, to other illnesses as well. So burnout is one of the most common things that we talk about when we're talking about mental health with Alzheimer's caregivers. So um, this uh, little poster was created in 2011. So it's a little bit outdated at this point, um, but so we're now actually up to about 16.2 million Americans providing unpaid care to an older adult. So that could be um, daughters and sons, it could be spouses, um, anyone who's providing unpaid care to an older adult and caregivers who provide substantial care several times a week um, are more likely to have physical and emotional health problems. Another thing that can lead to some burnout is the amount of financial burden that comes with caregiving. So as you can see, this orange slice here is out of pop pocket expenses for um, caregivers uh, for Alzheimer's disease and families who are affected by Alzheimer's disease. And it's at 76 billion for the whole country, 76 billion. So we are giving a lot of time, we are giving a lot of money, and that can be very, very draining. And up to 40% of dementia caregivers experience depression. So this open dialogue doesn't only go to um, the patients with Alzheimer's, this also goes for the caregivers. And it's important for caregivers to have people that they can talk to um, openly about how their mental health is doing. And then a final kind of complicating factor for caregivers is this idea of ambiguous loss. So ambiguous loss is a term that was coined by psychologist Pauline Boss in the 1970s. And she talks about ambiguous loss as the state where a loved one is physically present, but psychologically absent. And this is extremely relevant to Alzheimer's disease as the personality changes continue to happen over the progression of the disease. It can feel like you've lost your loved one before they're even gone, which leads to a sense of really complicated grief because how do you grieve someone who's still alive? 
But the fact is when relationships change, no matter what it is, people often experience a sense of grief. So it is okay to lean into the ambiguous loss, lean into the fact that you are grieving and losing something, um, the relationship, even if the person is still around. And this can also happen for ourselves. So if we are experiencing an illness and our personality is changing, our life is changing, um, you're still alive, um, but there is a huge sense of loss um, that doesn't necessarily have a ritual. There's no funeral to attend, there's no closure. It's just this feeling of um, grief that uh, can kind of continues and, and doesn't have a lot of closure. Um, so one thing that you can do to um, kind of address the sense of ambiguous loss is find ways to make rituals around it. Um, whether it's like, it's okay to ritualize the loss, um, whether it's printing out pictures of your life before this disease was ever part of your life, or whether it's doing some journaling, um, or just talking to friends and family about how things were before and letting it go. Um, those can be really powerful in supporting your mental health and adding in that ritual that isn't necessarily supported by our culture, but could be really helpful. Okay, and so let's talk a little bit more about uh, other types of resilience in addition to ritual. Um, so the antidote to all of this that we talked about is resilience. And um, resilience in the way that I speak about it is a little bit different than um, what Dr. Robinson was talking about in the very beginning. Um, in terms of resilience uh, genetically. So there's uh, biomedically, there's genetic resilience, um, which means you might have uh, some of the signatures of the disease inside your body, but you're not showing it outside. Um, and then mental health resilience is really about building up our mental strength. Um, so resilience is the ability to positively adapt in response to significant adversity due to trauma, tragedy, threats, or other significant sources of stress. Um, so when we're talking about resilience, we're talking about our ability to um, think on our feet, to cope with the stresses of daily life. And importantly, there are two aspects of resilience. And this, if you take away nothing else from today, I want you to take this away. There are two aspects of resilience that support our mental health. There are individual characteristics, and there are, is also environmental social support. So those things go together. You cannot maintain your mental health on your own, but there is a lot that you can do to maintain your mental health. Um, so it's both these individual actions, but also the social support that really come together to create the fabric of our mental health. And that's why it's so important for our communities to take care of each other. So ultimately what we're trying to do with resilience is um, support either support individual actions um, that give us strength in our mental health, or we can move this fulcrum, um, which represents the social support and help tip the scales um, closer to the positive outcomes. So we have both this environmental social support as well as our individual actions. So on an individual level, um, cultivating resilience, we can celebrate and connect with family and friends. We can talk about our feelings with a trusted therapist or a friend. We can exercise. We can practice mindfulness. And again, mindfulness doesn't have to be 20 hours of meditation. Um, it can just be checking in with yourself um, every few hours and really understanding how you're feeling or how your body's feeling. The um, National Institute on Aging also offers um, some ideas for cultivating individual, individual resilience um, here. They say, ask for help when you need it, spend time with friends, join a support group in person or online, take breaks each day, and keep up with hobbies. And these are, of course, um, specifically related to caregivers um, who are working with patients with dementia. Okay, I wanna hear your thoughts. What are some other ideas about how you could cultivate individual re resilience to support your mental health or how you do already cultivate resilience to support your mental health? And you can either unmute your mic or um, put questions in the chat, put ideas in the chat. 
One thing I do, I, I'm committed to listening to only positive things on TV. I mean yeah. that. I really, uh, I just don't listen to things. I just don't put anything in my brain that's negative. Yep, that's, um, it's important to, to be aware of what you're consuming. And of course, sometimes there are things that we can't look away from because they're important for the world, like, like COVID, but, but, but being able to kind of moderate how much negativity you're taking in can be very powerful for cultivating resilience. Well, I learned as much as I possibly could from trusted sources about COVID. I, I deal with things by hit, hitting it pretty well head on. And then I feel more in control when I really, really know what's going on. Yep, absolutely. And you actually just mentioned another one, Mary, that um, I like, which is uh, taking action when you can, but also knowing when to trust people um, and being willing to trust, but then taking action whenever you can. Avery misses um, Morris says reading books. And we yes. have another comment that says, prior to the pandemic, I would get regular massages. I really miss that. Um, yes, I echo that. <laughs> yeah. um, Mrs. Butler says, don't use social media as much as um, Facebook family. And then the other one is, I have quit TV and news broadcasts. They are too negative. Yep, I love all of those. Great. Okay, I am going to move forward now, but continue, you know, you can continue popping things into the chat um, if you would like as we go along and we can talk a little more in the Q&A as well. Um, but now I wanna talk about cultivating resilience on a structural level. And this is where I got really excited because I think there is so much we can do as a society, as a culture, in our policies, in, our, um, in the way we relate to each other to um, support people's mental health. So number one, we can put health first in our institutions, which may include things like family leave work policies that include caregiving for parents or spouses. So paid leave programs um, where uh, parents and sp or spouses are included in the people that you are allowed to take time off for. Um, we might be able to create other financial relief programs for families affected by Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then finally, we can also think about communities of care. How do we create neighborhoods or church groups that really know how to be there for each other? Um, that could include meal trains, um, which is like getting meals delivered to your house or neighborhood groups who are checking in, um, people to help you get to your appointments or to um, help just kind of do daily life together. So, I did want to check in briefly, um, and then we're going to turn it over to Pam. Um, what are some ideas that you had about cultivating resilience on a structural level, um, either in your neighborhood or groups you're part of, or maybe even um, on a policy level? Um, there's a comment in the chat that says, with COVID, it's difficult. When we went to um, get our first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, we waited for more than five hours. My husband got agitated and wanted to go home and take the car keys. I just explained to him that we had to wait for our turn and that we need this vaccination. So I think that speaks to um, what you're talking about in terms of health institutions doing their part to make the burden easier for the rest of us. Yes, um, I think that's so important. Like um, if, if that vaccination site could have had maybe some extra um, sort of care into patients who are coming who are suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's disease, um, we want to make sure that they can get their vaccine in a way that's not going to agitate them further. Um, using text to keep in touch is one. And then there's another one that speaks to um, the fact that there's a real gap in service regarding patients with dementia. There need to be more assisted living, living facilities specifically for those with memory loss issues as well. Those who are physically capable of doing um, their normal daily activities of living, but who suffer from memory loss. Yes, that is such, such good points in what you just shared. 
great. Well, again, you can keep throwing things in the chat. We can come back to this. And now I am, um, I'm hoping you're um, leaving my part of the presentation with um, a little bit of some ideas of how you can cultivate resilience and maybe some new information about um, the types of mental health issues that could come up. And now I'm going to turn it over to Pam. Thank you, Avery. Well, you guys touched on so many of the things that I that I, I had to talk about. So this is this is awesome. Uh, this is my this is my mother, and uh, uh, her Alzheimer's story, of course, is part of mine and my entire family's, and especially my children. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she was uh, born in Sunflower, Mississippi. She was the oldest of nine kids, mother of five, grandmother to thirteen. Uh, she was a widow at an early age at only 47. She never remarried. And around the age of 77 or so, she started to show some signs, you know, that, that something was going on. So those are just a few pictures of her. both of the ones uh, to the left and to the right are grandchildren, of course. Uh, I, I don't remember my mother being particularly sweet. She was a good mother, but she was a very sweet grandmother. <laughs> so I found this little quote on um, one of the websites that I'm gonna share today. And it's said to be a caregiver is to be a student of the human spirit. And I think that is amazingly true. Some of the first signs that I saw in my mom was just forgetting, you know, starting to lose things. I think even more so than forgetting, like she lost her medication. We never found the medication. So it just, things just disappeared. Uh, checks, uh, unable to manage her appointments, but she was able to manage her daily, um, you know, living things. She was, you know, she was preparing her own food. She was taking care of herself and taking care of the house and everything. She just wasn't able to keep up with things as well. And she told me uh, that, you know, that was getting stressful for her. So she asked me uh, before uh, she really, you know, started to have some more severe symptoms to take over her finances. And I'm glad that, that we did it when we did. So she was, uh, uh, de decisionally capable of, uh, you know, going to an attorney and saying, I want my daughter to take care of these things now. And it seemed like just relieving her from those things helped her to do a lot better. And for a couple of years, we managed well with me taking care of everything and she was able to stay in her house. Uh, one of the things that I didn't do when I saw those first signs that I certainly recommend for people that are starting to see that early or mild cognitive um, you know, decline in a family member is to start as soon as you believe there's something going on with having that conversation with the doctor, maybe if they're willing to take over some of their uh, decision-making things like their, you know, power of attorney for their finances and things like that, because you, you just don't know at what point things are going to shift, right? So uh, these are all things I didn't know. I didn't know anything about Medicare. There are things Medicare covers and things Medicare doesn't. I wasn't familiar with the local resources. And I, I lived in a town where it was pretty much me and my mother and my kids. All of my other siblings lived in other states. So it was just the two of us pretty much as a support system. And you know that left quite a bit to be desired as I'll, I'll share with you as I go on with my story here. Um, my mother and I had breakfast together every Sunday and we did this probably for a couple of decades. And I got to her house one Sunday morning and she had everything out of the fridge and she was cooking everything and gas stove, burners blazing. And it was just this, like the scariest thing I had ever seen. But of course, at that moment, I knew that A, we got to disconnect that stove and that we were getting to a point where she wasn't gonna be able to be there alone you know, anymore. So um, that was a major, that was a major milestone. So we tried several things. One was to, uh, like I said, I disconnected the stove. I was hand delivering every meal. I, it, it was a crazy schedule that no one person could keep up with. And I think as caregivers, on many occasions, we, we take on a whole lot <laughs> and it's really more than we could physically do, uh, maybe uh, not indefinitely for sure. So when that started to really uh, affect my job, I still had children at home myself. Um, we looked at um, seeing if working out a roommate situation with her so she wouldn't have to leave her house because she'd been in her home for 50 years. 
Well, of course, if you've been in your house for 50 years, you feel a great sense of ownership and bringing a stranger in to live with you, it just doesn't work for everybody. So certainly didn't work for Miss Grace. And uh, so from there, um, uh, some friends told us about a lady that had a group home. She only had uh, five seniors living there. And so my mother was like the sixth and that place was really comfortable. It was in the neighborhood where she grew up. So she felt really comfortable there, but they didn't have skilled nurses so they couldn't keep her blood sugar under control which meant when it got high, they called the, uh, an ambulance. And so we were getting calls in the middle of the night that she was going to the ER. So after that, I mean, uh, kind of unplanned, she ended up moving in with me. And I've always uh, described that as having an unexpected baby <laughs> because all of a sudden, you know, life has changed um, in huge ways and you are not prepared. And uh, I wasn't, I actually had been on my job for 17 years and they fired me while I was taking care of my mother. Um, about a year later, I had to sell my, my house. I had to give my car back and I did not really have a plan B. So I've got two children, uh, you know, a, a, a cute little lady, adorable as she was <laughs> in her late seventies. And we had to figure out what we were gonna do next. Uh, my sister was way out in Washington state, but that's what we did, we moved out to Washington. And the good thing that happened there is that I wasn't trying to take care of her all by myself. So together we figured it out and we, we had a schedule for her. She lived with my sister. I came in and helped with the daily activities and uh, we used the resource of day centers. And I know there's a number of them, um, you know, in the Nashville and surrounding area. Some actually accept uh, Medicaid and there are, I think some special benefits for veterans. But that kind of gives them some activity, some engagement with other people, gives the caregiver a break. And then, um, you know, it just all around, I thought it was really great uh, to get her out of the house. And, and like I said, to relieve, give us a little bit of space too. So as long as she was able to, she went to the daycare for four hours a day, uh, Monday through Friday. And um, we, were, we were able to manage very well for several years with that plan. But eventually, you know, the Alzheimer's progressed where it wasn't easy to get her in and out of a car. She didn't understand, you know, commands like bend down. And, you know, um, so all of a sudden, some of these activities that have become such a big part of us having some relief and also a big part of, uh, you know, her being able to have some social exposure, that those things kind of came to a, to a stop. But, um, we kept her out of a nursing home for several years. And um, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to work it out. And as hard as it was for me, I don't regret uh, any of it in hindsight, but I, I do feel like I have some advice to share. So one of the things I would say, if you're uh, thinking that this is a situation that you're gonna be in, or if you're in the throes of it right now, is that, it's, as much as possible, just figure out some ways to have some space between you and the disease. And I know, um, you know, Avery mentioned a lot of ways of, of, of uh, you know, taking advantage of some resources, uh, you know, giving self-care, I mean, massage, um, uh, any time that you can get away and really just focus on yourself is really as healthy for the person you're taking care of as it is for you. Because when you become exhausted, uh, you're not as, as good a caregiver. And I know that it's really hard. It was hard for me to accept help from other people. I was in, um, in a town where the majority of my immediate family was somewhere else. And many times I said, no, that's okay. Somebody said, can I come and sit with your mom and let you take your kids to the movies? No, that's okay. But guess what? <laughs> take it. If it's somebody that you know is gonna be kind to your loved one and you trust them, don't turn down any good help. Um, I had three people in my life when I was going through the turbulence of trying to keep my job and take care of my mom. And, you know, it's it still worked out that I ended up not working there. But I had a friend that would come and stay with my mother and let me take my kids out and get them away from it for a while. Uh, I had another lady that came and sang with my mother, helped clean, cooked for $200 a month. And uh, my siblings did help me with paying for that since I was unemployed. But just like essentially $10 a day, she came and did that for me. Um, 
and just uh, so many little kindnesses. I had a former supervisor that took my mom to some of her doctor's appointments so I wouldn't have to take off work. Uh, and it's just um, my first inclination with all of those because they weren't people that were particularly close to me was to say, no, thank you, but I got over it. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I certainly advise and recommend that if there are people that you trust and you know that they're coming from a good place and offering to do take advantage of the help that they offer. And just, um, it's already been touched on some, just plan for the inevitable. I think that just having so much coming at me at once and in the beginning, I didn't have a support system at all is that I really didn't examine what, how to plan for the inevitable. Um, I wasn't considering all those worst case scenarios and what I would do if those things happen. And then, like I mentioned earlier, just taking control of any finances and things like that as early as possible, because in the end, that's going to reduce stress on you if you kind of know, you know, what's going on. Because I will tell you, and this even happened with my mom before, um, before she gave me that power is that people get, you know, people around you, right? Sometimes uh, so-called friends or neighbors or whoever get a notion that you don't know exactly what's going on and things start to come up missing and um, and they take advantage. So uh, it's, it's not out of the question that those things actually do happen. But I am uh, just like that unexpected baby. Uh, like I said, there were many unexpected uh, angels and people that were kind to us and helped us get through it. And I think the thing that I wish I had taken more advantage of instead of just always being you know, in the, in the throes of it and trying to get through it was to really just take that time to find the beauty in being with that person that you love so much. And if it's a parent, a person that loved you so much, because you can still find some joy uh, in being with them. And I know one of the things is that they can say the most hilarious things sometimes. And I actually wish that I had journaled some of the great moments that I had with my mother and some of the hysterical things that she said sometimes, but she enjoyed singing and we sang and I just tried to keep her talking as much as possible. She turned out to be a great storyteller. You could give her the thread of anything and she would tell you all about it and all the people and, or, or if she was watching TV, she always thought that she knew the folks that were on TV, which was amusing, but uh, she always had the background stories on things, which was, which was pretty funny. But in all of that, I mean, I, I gave up everything and moved away, but I think I became a better person in many ways. I went back to school, I got my bachelor's degree and I wouldn't be here with you guys today and working for the Vanderbilt Memory and Alzheimer's Center if I hadn't gone back to school. So thank you, mama. But um, I just wanna be a part of lessening the burden on future generations and, I, and I, I wanna help to find a cure. So if there's any little thing that I can do here to support Dr. Robinson, and Avery and the rest of the team, I want to I want to be able to do it. So the other thing I want to do is just share some resources that I found. If you are really like looking for someone to kind of help you navigate these things, like figuring out what Medicare covers and knowing which places you can go to if you need some day, uh, you know, some day center care. I thought the Age Well website is amazing. They even have a little survey on there and it's called the Rubik, where you can put in the level of needs and capabilities for yourself or for the, a loved one. And it'll actually like give you a little report, an assessment of the kind of support that you might need. And, you know, and they can actually help you figure out you know, which of those resources uh, you need access to and how to get to them at cost. They, they are fantastic for that. Catholic Charities also has some day centers that I, I think are really low cost or no cost. They, they have some centers that offer respite care uh, to caregivers. And then Tennessee Disability Pathfinders, they are just navigators of all government and um, you know, state programs. Uh, they know where everything is. They even have uh, some support groups for caregivers that you can sign up for on their website. And uh, Tennessee Aging has a ton of resources, but overall, I thought AgeWell was the easiest one to use. They have it's a brand new website. They've got very clear directions for here's a directory of services. If you want to do that survey, you do that here. 
I, I just thought it was really nice and had a lot of really uh, great information. But one that I just thought was a beautiful website is this website called Memory Bridge. And it's just all about learning how to communicate with people with dementia once they become non-communicative. And it's just a beautiful website. And they do some webinars. In fact, there's one coming up next Tuesday uh, on April the 27th. There's no cost. If you want to donate, they ask for $5 to attend the webinar. But um, I just thought just the videos and other resources that they have on there were just really beautifully done. And those are the major, um, the major resources that I was able to find that are available in the area. And then of course we offer uh, our Alzheimer's support group at the Vanderbilt Memory and Alzheimer's Center. It's designed for caregivers and patients to attend at the same time. And uh, currently we're still virtual, but we have these two lovely ladies, Shelby and Natalie, that ho help to host uh, those groups. Some more resources uh, for living and caregiving for Alzheimer's. Of course, the Alzheimer's Association has tons of really thoughtful and uh, current um, information on, on the disease. And then 54, it has community centers, adult daycare services as well, and then care team services. Okay, well, thank you um, so much. Avery and um, Pam for sharing uh, all the resources, sharing the stories, and I hope giving um, everyone some um, ways to manage um, any mental health um, challenges that they may be experiencing directly or um, tools to use for others that they know may be experiencing them also. We have about um, five, about four or five-ish minutes. Um, if anyone has a question or um, a comment that you wanted to share, you may put that into the chat right now, or you can unmute your microphone. Um, there was a, um, a question, um, how do you find therapists, counselors that are equipped or have experience working with adults with Alzheimer's and our caregivers? You like that that's one? A, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think, um, uh, some of those resources that um, Pam was sharing, like the Agewell Tennessee might um, be a good place to check. And also the Alzheimer's Association helpline. Um, so the Alzheimer's Association helpline, which is right here, um, is a great line to call with questions like that um, because they are able to put you in touch with many types of resources, um, as well as getting in touch with the Tennessee Disability Pathfinder. It's going back to the point um, earlier about structural ways to build resilience. Um, there was a comment just speaking to how um, um, Ms. Grissom says, my mom goes to two doctors at one practice and they cannot see her on the same day unless one of them does not get paid. <laughs> so it's um, ridiculous, but it's driven by Medicare. Um, and so I don't know, Avery, if you wanna comment on like what that would look like for our um, institutions to fix those kind of structural issues. Yes, yes, that is, um, oh my gosh, that is such a good example. Um, so there are essentially change management frameworks that we can use. So um, a big one that I'm a fan of is trauma-informed care and basically putting patients at the center of decision-making in clinics um, and other places. So um, that type of that type of complaint or problem that you're bringing up is a perfect thing for when management decides that they're ready to undergo these changes that put patients first. Those are the types of um, things that they wanna survey community for to understand what exactly needs to change. Um, and so I would encourage you, it can be sometimes really frustrating because it feels like all the power is in these clinics or all the power is somewhere outside of us, but I would encourage you to, um, as much as you can, respond to any survey that a clinic sends you. Um, be as concrete in your feedback as possible. Um, it's okay to bring those issues up um, straight to the management of these clinics. It's also um, great to go ahead and um, submit some of these ideas for change to the Tennessee Commission on Aging and Disability um, because they're really looking statewide at some recommendations they can make for clinics and other facilities. 
Um, so I am definitely sorry that you have to deal with that and please do speak up as much as possible. Yeah, and the you know, follow-up, is it really the clinic that's the issue or Medicare? Um, right. And I definitely think you know, within the clinic, there are things that they can do to combat the issues that may be occurring with Medicare, right? Um, because they're, you know, most of them are privately owned or they have a uh, power in terms of how they do the scheduling and things like that, that can it still alleviate some of the burden for patients. Um, they may not realize they have that power, I think is part of the issue too. Um, so we're out of time, but um, I just wanted to close and share um, a comment from Mrs. Lauderdale that says, I really do appreciate this presentation. My parental grandmother and her daughter my aunt were both diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, we're sorry to hear that. My cousin is taking care of her mom. My aunt took care of her mother before she died years ago. Um, so something that we all you know, are experiencing in so many different ways in our families. Um, and she says that this presentation and discussion has really helped her and her family and thank you again. Um, so thank you, um, Ms. Avery Holler, and thank you, Mrs. Pam Cowley, for sharing again on today. Thank you to everyone for participating and attending. We will follow up with you all this week with the resources that came up during today's presentation and any others that come to mind by email, um, as well as you'll receive a recording of today's presentation. Um, we will look for you next month on the third Wednesday in May. Um, and we're gonna talk about digital stuff in May. So fun things with apps and um, all the different ways that we can stay engaged digitally. So that will be next month. So please have a good rest of your Wednesday and good afternoon. Thank you everyone for coming.